So my name is Ruben Miller. I'm the product owner of ThinEdge. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, the remote access feature uh, that was introduced since 0 0.10. And I want to go through a bit of a demo and then try to um, better explain how it kind of what's working under the hood and to better understand it and see what kind of uh, to demystify some of the magic there. So what is the remote access feature? So it's a Commonwealth specific feature uh, that gives users access to the device um, for via other TCP based protocols. Uh, so other TCP based protocols such as SSH, VNC. Um, so to be able to access the device using other tooling, not that just the MQTT um, or HTTP kind of interfaces. So first of all, why would you want to do this? Let's remove that. So in the perfect world, everything just works. However, we don't live in the perfect world, so uh, there's often cases where maybe your IoT device is misbehaving either because you've deployed new applications on it and you kind of need to have a better understanding of what's going on. Um, so the remote access feature allows you to better do your advanced debugging on these devices. Uh, so you can maybe do advanced kind of uh, interactive debugging sessions. Um, so ThinEdge already provides like log management and shell execution. However, for the really tricky problems, you sometimes need a little bit more to actually, you know, SSH onto the device to really see what's going on and see you know do some greps over some logs um, to better diagnose the problem and then maybe roll out the fix later on another common use case is maybe the your iot device is running some kind of local ui and because it's we're talking about iot devices you generally don't want to then have a open port where you make the ui available um, so you can actually you might only want to restrict it to the local host so it's not then publicly accessible uh, outside of the network or like a, from the device um, but you still want to access this ui so the remote access then allows you to do port forwarding um, so you can actually access securely this local endpoint and it can also be then encrypted via ssh so the common uh, the ways that we definitely use it and i've uh, used it with other customers uh, so the interactive SSH sessions is very, very useful um, because it also makes the device accessible from anywhere else or anywhere in the world. Um, and because you're not publishing your open parts, um, you can do it securely. And because you have SSH, you can also then do SCP, so secure copy. Um, so you can actually do transfer then files from your laptop to that remote device using your SSH connection. I said before, you can do port forwarding again with SSH. Um, I believe we also have some customers using um, debugging code sys applications um, by also using the TCP proxy part and be able to, I think, run the application live and see what the, the actual values are in the control program which is running. Uh, and also uh, VNC is available. So if you, if you have some kind of desktop application running on your device, then you can also access the UI via that. So now let's actually see what's uh, see this feature in action. Uh, so what I'm going to demo is how to access then your node red, which is running on the device itself. So we'll start off with so uh, the kind of construct of this kind of use case. So ThinEdge is more of a vehicle to deliver your IoT solution. So it's a fundamental part of your IoT solution because it does the cloud connection and that facilitates a lot of the hard to do things so you don't have to implement yourself. However, the real value is then maybe what IoT applications and the customization that you want to do. So you can already deploy the applications via the software management features. Uh, from thin edge but then you might want to do additional features like create a custom flow in node red so what i want to show is so i have node red running on the device and now i want to actually access the ui and see what's going on there because maybe my workflow is not working correctly so here we have so the comlocity uh, device here so that's my raspberry pi and now all I want to do is 
connect to this device and do a port forwarding. So I'm just trying to port forward the 1880 from the remote device to my local port 1880. And this is the device I'm connecting to. So this is the device there. So if I just press enter now, it will establish my connection. We should actually see here because I have a um, an automatic event uh, notification that I've created when a shell session gets added that I can see, hey, it's doing something. So my SSH session has started and the what user started it, etc. So once I'm in here, because I've done the port forwarding, I can actually then access this local port. So this is running on the device. And so I can see that on the device, that I have a temperature flow running. So this is a simple uh, node red flow that I created uh, just for demonstration purposes, which subscribes to the measurements and looks for temperature measurements, looks for if there's a significant change in the temperature, creates an event accordingly. So for example, that would be a classic if you have a sensor and if the temperature spikes, um, you know, jumps 10 degrees suddenly, that usually is an indication that the sensor is dead. Um, so you can do a bit of like uh, getting a notification when you might need to change out the sensor. So I can do all the things that you would normally do in Node-RED. So you can even, you know, adjust the project and redeploy it uh, and everything via securely um, via the remote access feature. Uh, so this device could also be, you know, sitting anywhere else in the world and it's then secured access using my Comelocity credentials um, that are provided here. Uh, so you don't need to do extra user management or anything. Everything's just kind of very conveniently linked with your IoT solution. So let's have a look at the flow just to kind of show for demonstration purposes. Uh, so currently, let me just do a split screen. So the moment I have some temperature data here, so I'm just going to simulate some data um, and we'll, I'll do a slow ramp. So I'm just going to go from 20 to 25 degrees and then back down. But because I'm doing one degree increments, this shouldn't, this isn't like a significant change in my temperature. Uh, so I shouldn't actually get any events. And we can see kind of the measurements flowing in. So it kind of ramps up and ramps down. But if I look at the events, then I don't have any events here. But if we do the same thing now with using a temperature spike, so here I'm jumping from 20 to 30 degrees, back down to 25. And then suddenly I get a temperature event and everything's good and working correctly. So now maybe I wanted to kind of see, you know, dig around what's on the device. Um, or, or let's simulate when something goes wrong. So I can do all my normal commands here. So if I just stop the service, maybe node red. Connection confused because I'm doing port forwarding. Let me just kill that. So let's imagine that you start on this device and then part of my Node-RED um, application is Node -red, um, that I also have using the new service monitoring. So I also have an indication that when, for whatever reason, that the uh, Node-RED application isn't running, I see you have a error notification here that my service is down. So that's my first indication, oh, something's not running properly. So I look there and going, well, hmm, I don't really know what to, you know, what the error could be. So, you know, this is where kind of connecting uh, via SSH might be useful. So I can then connect to my device using SSH and then have a bit of a poke around. So I could even do like a journal CTL and have a look there interactively and going, OK, you know, that looks OK because that's not really saying it's not running. But if I look at the service status. It confirmed that it's inactive and dead and they go, ah, OK, yep, 
I accidentally stopped it. So let's start it again. And we can see it's now doing stuff. So providing that kind of SSH access is super useful just for those quick and trickier situations um, where it might not be obvious then from the UI in Comulosity uh, what's actually going on. Um, so it's providing both uh, additional UI features, but also like um, troubleshooting features. And we can now see that my node red application is now green again. So the, the flow is then up and running. And yeah, so what's actually happening under the hood? Oh, actually, before I do that, so one way of accessing it is via this, it's called native SSH. So by doing a native SSH client um, using the pass through feature, um, you can also access it via the web SSH. We have the window here and then you can, so that's handy if you don't have maybe a, a, a client which has direct access to it for whatever reason. Uh, so you can do the same stuff here. Red. And so everything's kind of working as expected. The only difference is because it's web SSH, it's slightly slower than native SSH, um, but it can be good for the kind of quick once off kind of interactive sessions. Um, but the native SSH slash uh, pass through feature is definitely one of my favorite features because you can also do everything that you can do in SSH. You can do once off commands, um, SCP and all that kind of magic stuff, which is a lot more convenient. And it feels a lot more uh, snappier in terms of like the response because there's basically less of a kind of, you know, a back and forth in between the different kind of components. So how is all this magic working? So to do that, I'll show it in the um, in PowerPoint. So how does all of this work? So in the end, let's say you have a power user that wants to access the device um, via SSH. So SSH always needs a client and a daemon or service. So that's represented here. In normal scenarios, or if you're in the local network, then you might be able to oops, establish these connections directly because maybe you're in a secured network um, where that's okay. However, if your device is hang, um, connected to the internet directly, then generally that is very frowned upon because it's not very secure, and then anyone um, can access your device from the internet, uh, and that's generally something you don't want. So how do we then make this secure? So before we do this, we need to add a bit of infrastructure stuff in. So we've added the, the Commonwealth IoT platform, we have ThinEdge here, which then has an always running uh, MQC connection to the IoT platform. Then we also have the remote access plugin, which was then introduced in 0 0.10 from ThinEdge. So this is a separate binary. It's not a process which is always running. It's just a binary which is then called by ThinEdge uh, when it receives an operation. Then on the left side, so the clients or the power users laptop, um, we need an additional piece of software, which is also an open source uh, project, a small project written in Python um, that is called the Comulosity Local Proxy. So that knows how to talk to Comulosity um, and that acts as the local proxy. So the go between between the SSH and the cloud. So when the user wants to connect uh, to the remote device via SSH, they start the session saying SSH, my device. Using standard SSH configuration, you can actually configure that saying, hey, when I access this device, I want you to use the local proxy um, to call this application, which is running on your device. So it proxies the command there saying, ah, I need to do something before I can actually establish the connection. So please, please execute that. The local, oops. The local proxy then creates an operation, Comulosity. It then establishes a WebSocket, which is then an always on or like a running connection. Comulosity then in turn sends an operation from the cloud to the ThinEdge device, which already has, you know, receives it by the MQC publish. 
that interprets the message and go, ah, okay, this is a remote access request. It calls remote access plugin. The remote access plugin then establishes its own WebSocket to the cloud. And the cloud kind of joins this socket with this socket. And it just proxies it using a transparent proxy. So it just goes, okay, bytes in, bytes out um, in both directions. And then from then on, once that connection is then established, then the WebSocket is then proxied to the SSH daemon. So in the end, um, semantically, you're, we have this bidirectional arrow here, but it's kind of going through this kind of uh, this path here. So this is all um, kind of stuff that happens under the hood. It's kind of implementation details that the user doesn't really have to worry about too much um, because everything can still work by the SSH configuration. So it works. So everything just feels like native that it just works out of the box. So, you know, nothing like a, if I was connecting to my, you know, that IP address, that just works exactly how it use um, SSH in normal circumstances. Uh, so it's just an additional SSH configuration, which is required to facilitate that. And then everything just works as expected. So we have a few references here um, that you can check out the, the local proxy uh, project um, and also the documentation if you're not familiar with the cloud remote access, uh, because you have to make sure you have the right permissions. Uh, so we have a link to the documentation uh, from Convolocity, how to enable that. So I think moving forward, it's a, an enabler for any project because as your IoT project grows, you have more and more components being added and you know the more uh, chance that something will go wrong or even in the development phase, it's very helpful that you can kind of track and easily connect to your device. Uh, and it simplifies the connectivity to the devices um, because you're not just relying on being in the local network. Uh, so it's very convenient for us as a team because we're not located in the same uh, regions as we can actually also access all of our test devices by this feature as well. So that concludes my demo for the remote access feature and back to you, Philip.